So beginning in Acts, the first chapter, verse 4, it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea, in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, their angels, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go in the heaven and all the church said Amen. and my subject is Jesus out of sight but not out of mind out of sight but not out of mind I just read Jesus final words to his disciples before his ascension back to heaven he responds to their question about Israel's future which most of us even do, who are under the sound of my voice or watching with us on television, the future, the future, the future. So in Acts 1 and 6, you see this question. As Jesus prepares to ascend back to heaven, are you at this time, when you come back, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? At this time in Israel's history, they were under Roman oppression. His disciples wanted to know when he would return as a prince and a conqueror over Israel's enemies. You see, it's innate as human beings to long for the ability to lift the curtain that separates the future from the present. Some of you in front of me, you price is right. Let's make a deal, folk. How many times have you tried to guess as what's behind the curtains? That's it. That's how I wanted to leave you hanging. <laughs> Wondering what's behind door number one, door number two, door number three. Because those curtains for my sermon represent the future. What does the future hold? Again, it's in, innate in us to want to know. But the problem with some of you here today, you worry a little bit too much about the future and not enough about the present. It's all right, I'm going to preach. Listen to what Jesus says to those worrying about what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to wear, how they're going to pay their bills. Their job is lost. Divorce is imminent. Children in trouble. Problem with relatives. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31 to 34. So don't worry saying what we'll eat, what we'll drink, or what we'll wear. For the pagans, meaning those who don't know God, run after what? All these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But what are we to do? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of his own. I'm going to get me some help up in here. That is a place 
that you must mature to in life. To not be overly concerned. I didn't say not to be concerned, but overly concerned to the point of worry about your future. Because what we have to deal with each day is enough. I'm going to preach this message. I believe in staying healthy. I try to work out, stay in shape, because I stay under immense loads of pressure. Immense. And again, God is a comedian. He got a little five foot five guy that takes immense loads of stress. And I'm healthy. I just took my blood pressure three days ago. 123 over 81. And as we're teaching in the marriage class, uh, I don't let other people mess stress me out. See, when you mature in life, you're not going to let the thing that you can't control wear you out. Let me just preach to a couple of people. See, you got to reach a place in your walk with God that when you've done all you can in the present, you leave the future to him. Well, why? The, the, they sang it. He'll stay with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Leave it in the hands of God so you can enjoy your today and not end up with a stroke or a heart attack or just downright mean and evil. These are the essential words that Jesus says in my text verses in response to their what about tomorrow in verse 7 of Acts 1. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father set by his own authority. In other words, that ain't none of your business. Mind your own business. You see, their question is irrelevant to their present business and their future work. Listen carefully. Duty is now. It's God's job to provide for the future. You see, the Father is in control of world events. All things come to us, not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. Jesus then tells his disciple their duty and ours as well until he returns in verse number 8. When he says, you will see power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. and You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, uh, in Judea, in Samaria, until the uttermost ends of the earth. Bible students know that verse 8 of chapter 1 of Acts is the theme for the entire book. This is the only historical book in the New Testament, whereas we have 12 in the Old Testament. This is the only book that gives us the history of the church from the time Jesus sends back to heaven and until the gospel is made known to the end of the earth, which at that time was Rome, because the saying was, all roads lead to Rome. Note, the gospel for the Jesus started at home in Jerusalem. Just as the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus tells his disciples they needed the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit if they were to be his witnesses. One of the sad things that goes on in churches today is the number of people who do not have the Holy Spirit. They've been in church their whole life. And when you ask them, when were you born again? When did, when did you repent? When did you ask Jesus to come inside and live? They can't even tell you. But they'll tell you when they started trying to do better. But the gospel is not about you doing better. It's about Jesus doing the best on Calvary's cross for your sins. Some teach that the Holy Spirit is an it. But the scriptures are clear. The Holy Spirit is God. And I'm going to deal with that in my Bible class this Tuesday. In John, the 15th chapter and the 26th verse. The verse reads, I'm in the right chapter. That ain't even the right chapter. So 
excuse me on this one, I, did, I made a little mistake, but what the scriptures are teaching us is that the Holy Spirit has got over and over again in scripture, and again, I will deal with that. Oh, I have it right. I'm just not reading right. I don't know. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> oh, no wonder I'm in Luke. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, that explains it. <laughs> so this is the right scripture. When the advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will what? Testify about me. You don't have a it in you. You have the Holy Spirit who is God living in you. How does a it move? How does, how does a it get you shouting? How does a it get you moving and you can feel them in your hands and your legs and your feet? God Almighty in the presence and in the power of the Spirit comes and indwells every believer. So much so that the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 that every believer is baptized, not just by water, but by the Spirit into the body of Jesus Christ. You see, the Holy Spirit, which the followers of Jesus would receive 10 days later after his ascension on the day of Pentecost, gave them power. You can't live for Christ without the power of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, we saw an dis awesome display of the power of God. The power to speak in a language they had never been taught. The power to preach the gospel. The power to see men and women, over 3,000 people convicted by the preaching of the apostle Peter. The power to take Peter, who was running away from people and denying Jesus. Now he can stand up and preach for Jesus because something is down on the inside he didn't have before. The power to endure tests and trials. You see, witnessing is much more than testifying about Jesus. The Greek word uh, that we use for, for martyr, you see, the Greek word is martyr. The English word is martyr. So we get our English word from the Greek word. According to Fox's Book of Martyrs, with the exception of the Apostle John, all of the twelve were killed for their faith in Jesus. Polycarp was one of those. He had a, a dream, and in his dream, his pillow was set on fire. And he later took that to understand that he was going to die by fire. Three days later, Polycarp was arrested. You must understand what was going on there. All he had to do was deny Christ and they'd have set him free. That's all he had to do. All he had to do was say, Jesus is not Lord, Caesar is Lord, he's gone. If you don't, you're going to die, Polycarp. I quote to you these historic words from Polycarp himself. And only the old people in the church who've been walking with Jesus a long time can amen this. Everybody can't amen everything. Because some of y'all ain't paid enough dues to already amen anything. But there's some people out here, they've been walking with Jesus for 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years. They've been through ups and downs, tears and laughter. They know more about Jesus than you could ever imagine. Polycarp said these words. Eighty and six years have I served. Oh, I want to shout right now. This old man, he said, eighty and six years have I served him. And he ain't never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who have saved me? I'm going to say that again because I'll shout it by myself. If someone asks you going to give up Jesus, maybe you can't say 80 and 6 years, but you can say 20 years and 30 years and 40 years. Have I served him? And he has never wronged me. How shall I blaspheme my king who have saved me? The proconsul threatened, I will tame you with fire unless you repent. 
Polycarp once again responds, you threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour, and is soon extinguished, but the fire of future judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly you're ignorant of. Then he says, why delay? Do whatever you please. I'll tell you later, that Polycarp was a bad old man. You see, brothers and sisters, we as believers talk about being on fire for Jesus. But Polycarp was literally set on fire for his faith in Jesus Christ. And I want you to keep on being on fire for Jesus. But don't forget, more Christians died in the 20th century for their faith than all the other centuries combined. If this church, is, if this faith of ours is not worth dying for, it's not worth living for. And as I close, I hope I've made it clear what we as believers are to be doing until Jesus' second coming. Not looking up into the sky. Can you imagine these disciples looking up in the sky? It had to blow their mind. Jesus on the cloud just taking off. A cloud is vapor. How can a cloud hold a body? And if you believe it can, then jump out the plane. <laughs> Plenty clouds there. You know it was a vapor. They were watching a miracle. He, he ascended back up to heaven. And what that can do, it can make you of no earthly use. Because if your focus becomes only heaven, then you forget the things that still are undone on earth. We still have ministry of social justice. We still have ministry to help the poor, to help the needy, to help the oppressed, to help those who are falsely incarcerated, to stop the human trafficking, to stop the opioids. We got a job to raise our families and to do good. We can't be looking up into heaven. We got to tell your neighbor, got too much work to do. As Jesus said, we are occupying, doing good, using our gifts, our talents to build his kingdom here on, on earth. So we know what we ought to be doing now. The question is that we don't often talk about in the church is what is Jesus doing now? We saw him ascend back to heaven. What's he doing now? You see, brothers and sisters, I end my message. We tend to forget those who we have not seen in a long time. We have a saying for it. We call it out of sight, out of mind. How many times have you run up on somebody you ain't seen in a long time, it used to be close to, and then you got to play it off? Hey! What's up? <laughs> How you been? How's the family? You know good and well you can't remember their name. <laughs> Come on, can I get some help out here? You know, you know, it's, it's. It's, <laughs> it's so embarrassing to you, you don't even want to own it. Oh, man, it was really good to see you. <laughs> then you got to go home to your wife. Uh, you know, I saw such and such. You remember he, he was tall, he was, you could, <laughs> what was his name? Because out of sight can be out of mind. So the question is, Jesus is out of sight for 2,000 years. But a believer will tell you he's not out of mind. Let me say that again. He's been out of sight for 2,000 years, but any believer will tell you he's not out of mind. He can't be out of mind when he's living in your heart every day. So the question is, what is Jesus doing now as I wrap this up? Let me flow this for you. The first thing Jesus did was he ascended back to heaven. But he ascended back to heaven with the blood. Look what the scriptures say. He gets back to heaven 
at Re Revelation 5, 9, and 10, said they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, open the seals, because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Tell your neighbor, that's me. So the first thing he does is show the blood. Well, what does he do next? Well, his work was finished. So then he sat down. Get it. Then he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Now, see, because we're human, we're thinking that that means like, well, God's on the left and Jesus on the right. No, 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 no. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when the Bible talks about the right hand of God, it is a figure of speech for the power of God. And the only way you can see the invisible God is in the flesh that he took on in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he sat down, as the scripture says in Hebrews 12, on the right hand of the throne of God. And now what is he doing there? Well, the scriptures tell us he's making intercession. Look at the next scripture. He's sitting there. I want you to know, Mother, what's going on in heaven right now. There is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Ask your neighbor again, say, I'm trying to understand. What is he doing now? What's he doing now? What's he doing? So let me tell you some more. As he sits there, Satan accuses every last one of you. I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and power of the kingdom and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them. No, now read, read. Not accuses sometimes, but accuses before our God day and night. Day and night. He's finding something wrong with you. Oh, I'm a, can I preach my message? You told a lie. You were mean. You did that. You were watching porn, even though you've been trying to stop. You hit your husband on the head with the frying pan. He's accusing day and night. Not only does he accuse, your conscience accuses. Know what the scriptures say. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. So not only does Satan accuse us and others accuse our own consciences when we fail God, we don't even want to come to church. We don't feel worthy. We done messed this up and messed that up. But I got some good news for somebody. We fight. We win. We fight. We win. Every time the devil accuses you of something, Jesus ain't got to argue, mother. He ain't got to defend whether you did it or not. Well, what does he do? He just showed up blood. When he showed up blood, devil got to shut up. <laughs> because, see, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So every time Satan comes, Jesus said, I'm going to sit on this throne until every sin you have committed, past, present, and future, has been covered with the blood. This is the reason. I'm sorry, Mother, the Holy Ghost on me. This is the reason, for those who don't understand our language, this is why we please the blood. That's why we plead the blood. Lord, I did it, but your blood will cover it. Lord, I ain't right, 
but your blood will cover it. Lord, I didn't handle something right that I'm ashamed of, but your blood's got it. His blood is so rich. His blood so powerful. His blood so awesome. No matter how much sin you committed, the blood of Jesus covers it. Because if he didn't cover it, you'd be convicted. You'd be upset. But now you can come with your conscience clean. You can come and have a praise for God, though you had a rough week. You can come and say, I don't care what you say, say, I plead the blood of Jesus. This is the reason when a believer is sick in their body. If this blood could cleanse sin, if this blood could raise from the dead, then this blood can heal your body then this blood can get you a job. Then this blood can heal your marriage. Then this blood can cause your kids to start acting right. Then this blood can bring your unsaved relatives to a right relationship with Christ. Tell your neighbor, I plead the blood. Mm. I'm sorry. We're just going to take one minute. I'm through preaching and give God some praise up in this house. We're going to magnify him. Let the blood wash. Let the blood stain people of Jesus Christ. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, I'm through preaching. But because that I can plead the blood, I'm an overcomer. Nothing that you can't achieve. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org.